Welcome to Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains podcast, a collaborative project of the Kansas Historical Foundation and Department of History at Kansas State University. I am your host, Lisa Caitlin Highsmith, and today I am joined by Alan Rosler, who will be discussing his article, The Victory Loan Flying Circus in Wichita, May 1st, 1919, and the Victory Loan Campaign that brought it there. Alan Rosler is a graduate of the University of Central Missouri, who is now retired and living in Mesa, Arizona. He is a member of the League of World War I Aviation Historians and is a former managing editor and issue editor of Over the Front. Hello, Mr. Rosler. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Lisa. I really appreciate this opportunity. Could you maybe tell us what first drew you to this research for the article that was published in Kansas History? Sure. Um, I've always been interested in military history, clear from when I was a little kid. I built model airplanes from World War I. This goes back to when I was, you know, 10 or 12 years old. I built World War I model airplanes. So that started, you know, 60 years ago. So that's, there's a long history of that. I was also in the Army Reserve and I was in the Missouri National Guard as well. But to get back to this, Well, in 2012, I began receiving digital images of the Victory Loan Flying Circus Middle West flight air show scenes from the grandson of one of the SPAD 7 pilots. That was First Lieutenant Franklin O'Carroll. And the grandson's name is also Franklin Otis Carroll. These included photo images in which Carroll flew in most of the air shows in the 23 different Middle Western cities between April 11th and May 10th, 1919. Carroll had arranged his photograph album chronologically by city, supplying the necessary information about where they were taken. Newspapers confirmed the dates and supplied detailed descriptions of those air shows, verifying where and when the photographs were taken. At the same time, I had a research partner, Alan Tolley, that I work with closely, who was also a fellow issue editor of Over the Front. And as you said, that was the journal of the League of World War I Aviation Historians. Now, Alan was coincidentally working on preparing an article on the Victory Loan Flying Circus Far West flight, and he had researched and obtained the war diary records of both the Far West flight and the Middle West flight from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Now, Alan's article, which is called Wings Over America, the Victory Loan and Flying Circus Far West flight, was published in Over the Front in the winter 2014 issue. And the Far West flight had the same number of airplanes and personnel as the Middle West flight. And also, um, Most of the photo images are available in the San Diego Aerospace Museum website. And Alan Tully initially thought that I would write and publish an article on the Middle West flight and do one long article. But I wanted to do more in-depth research and focus instead on the individual cities that they visited. But even at that time, I had over 250 photo images, but it took a while to verify in which cities the photographs were taken. Now, some of the cities had extensive photo coverage, and some cities had very little photo coverage. It was kind of like fitting pieces of a puzzle together. And I also needed to find local newspaper articles that describe these events. So this is what drew me into the research and the fact that it had never been done before. And if I didn't do it, then it would be lost to history. For example, there are dozens of Middle West flight photo images that are available today for viewing at the San Diego Aerospace Museum, the Paul Aldrin Smith photo album. But I'm the only person who was ever able to accurately identify who the people are in those photographs, as well as where the photographs were taken. And the reason why that I know that's because Paul Smith and Frank Carroll were buddies and they shared photographs with each other. So the photographs in the Frank Carroll album were essentially the same photographs in the Paul Smith album. I was also able to study the old topographic maps and the Sandboard fire insurance maps from that time period to try to verify the photograph locations. And to that extent, I've never found anyone else outside of Alan Tolley and myself who have ever had anything published on the 1919 Victory Loan and its accompanying Victory Loan Flying Circus, which was utilized to help cities meet their quota of bonds to sell. And I've compiled all that data from at least 16 of the 23 cities in which they flew air shows in. 
And for some of the smaller cities like Sioux City, Iowa and Fargo, North Dakota, the company newspaper articles just don't seem to be available or they're in such poor condition that you just can't read them. Can you, for our listeners, kind of set the context for the Victory Liberty Loan campaign and explain to our listeners what exactly a flying circus is? Yes, the Victory Loan campaign was the fifth and last campaign the federal government used to sell war bonds. Now, the first four Liberty Loan campaigns to sell war bonds, the general population during World War I was an effort that America used to finance the war. They did this rather than raising taxes. Now, after the armistice in France on November 11th, 1918, America just couldn't load all of its troops on ships and ship them home. They had to occupy Germany, at least until the Treaty of Versailles was signed. And that left about a million troops in France and Germany during the first half of 1919. The Treasury Department needed four and a half billion dollars to balance their budget and bring the troops home. And the best way they could do that was to have another war bond issue. And since the war was over, they call it the Victory Loan or the Victory Liberty Loan, since the federal government in issuing bonds was essentially being loaned money by its citizens. The Treasury Department then partnered with the Air Service, which was then trying to build up its image and display its technological capability and expertise. Now, the term flying circus was not a new term at that time. The term itself started in France during World War I and referred to the wild, colorful paint schemes that German fighters used and the fact that they flew in mass formations. In America, post-war, it was supposed to refer to the gaily painted airplanes that flew around the region, but most people previously knew these what we called barnstormers. But for all practical purposes, the Far West flight and the Victor Loon Flying Circus, for example, was just a flying circus, just as the Middle West flight was, with four Fulker D-7s, four Spad 7s, four SC-5s, and five Curtis Jennies. But the Curtis Jennies were not painted in what we would call circus colors in the Far West flight. But the Middle West flight Curtis Jennies, however, were painted with extravagant, colorful, wild paint schemes, which were not shown in the Wichita article. The German Fokker D-7s that flew in Wichita had colorful fuselages and wings, but they were not painted. They were four or five color fabric. The Spaz and SC-5s are just an olive drab to a brownish color. So in this flying circus, were there any particular standouts? Who are the stars of this theatrical display? The stars of the circus were the four aces who agreed to join the tour to help sell victory loan bonds in the aftermath of World War I, as well as fly during most of the air shows. In the Far West flights, the aces were not allowed to fly at all. The primary attraction to the Middle West flight was Captain Anthony Beauchamp Proctor. He was a 54 victory Royal Air Force ace who was qualified as the premier aerobatic pilot in the world at that time. But for some unknown reason, he did not fly in a Wichita air show, but the other three aces did. Uh, two of the aces, Captain Thomas Trail from the Royal Air Force and Major Edgar Tobin, an ace who originated with the famous Lafayette Escadrille, were flying Fokker D-7s in Wichita, which in their established program attacked the Curtis Jennies after they dropped their victory loan literature over Wichita. And then they engaged in mock combat with flight instructors flying the SPADs and SC-5s. Now the fourth ace is William P. Irwin of Dull Air Race fame, who flew one of the Curtis Jennies. But Irwin, however, crashed or he forced landed his airplane while flying with a newspaper reporter. And that was one of the photos published in the Kansas History article. The aces were supposed to create more excitement and enthusiasm during the tour. A proctor, however, flew consistently day in and day out and took considerable risks in the process. The press media was typically eager to interview the pilots before the air shows, and Captain Urban was initially just as enthusiastic to relate his memory of his most recent past as he was enthusiastic about being on this tour. However, Proctor, Trail, and Tobin rarely gave interviews to the press, while Irwin was the only one who spoke freely to the press, and his stories of his exploits in France tended to vary from city to city. 
So how big of a deal is it that Wichita, Kansas got one of these circuses to perform there? Your article highlights just how big of a turnout that there was for this show. Well, the plan was for the Middle West flight to host their air shows in the major population centers in the Midwestern states. However, there was also quite a bit of last minute schedule changes. Des Moines was dropped at the last minute because Chicago had been rained out for the first time that they traveled through there. So they skipped Des Moines and instead they flew what amounted to an unadvertised air show in Chicago. And Chicago at that time had 2.7 million people in 1920. Wichita actually had the most important population center in Kansas in 1919. The initial plan was to start their tour by traveling northward from New Orleans along the Mississippi River Valley. And then after crossing through the Great Lakes region, they would travel southward through the Missouri River Basin. Then after staging air shows in Sioux City, Omaha, and Kansas City along the Missouri River, they also needed to stage air shows in the large population centers of the Great Plains Basin on their way back to Houston, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, and Wichita. And those cities are all about the same size and population at that time. What was extraordinary about the Wichita Air Show was the percentage of the population that attended, which is about 35%. And that equates to about 24,500 people. The Middle West flight actually estimated about 25,000 people attended the air show. Now, Wichita was certainly considered a major Midwestern city, and there were several smaller cities where they flew air shows, examples being like Sioux City, Iowa, for instance, and there were several smaller cities in South Dakota, Aberdeen, Redfield, uh, Sioux Falls, for instance, South Dakota, uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota. So there are actually several smaller cities where air shows were flown. Now, according to you in your article, Wichita met its quota for victory bonds despite the difficulties that it encountered along the way. And that was thanks to the hype that the Flying Circus brought. What would have happened if they hadn't met that quota? I think the hype was exaggerated. The victory loan was a good investment and it sold out everywhere. The railroads and banks bought up all the leftover bonds that were not otherwise purchased by local citizens. As I mentioned in the article, a lot of the problems was not solicitation was not allowed as it was in other states, although soldiers did some soliciting in downtown city streets, but this was not organized soliciting. What really helped were the parades during the last week of the loan, with the soldiers returning home through the Victory Arch. That helped more than the air show. The Victory loan sold out everywhere, so that was never an issue. It was also quite common and unsurprising for the railroads and banks to buy all the remaining bonds at the last minute. If they had done that at the beginning of the loan, they would have been accused of depriving the population of their potential income investment. There were local towns or cities that didn't sell their quota of bonds, which were turned back in. But those were then just redistributed and sold somewhere else. It was more of a community patriotism thing to meet your quota. The print media, which newspapers primarily, did a really good job of keeping people informed of daily progress of bond sales, meetings to promote sales and parades. How important do you think it is to look at these instances of community patriotism and spirit? This instance of community patriotism and spirit was vital. If you look back at what America had been through the previous two years, cutting back on what they ate and spent, buying liberty bonds and saving war stamps, and joining volunteer organizations like the American Red Cross, the Girl Scouts of America, 4-H, Campfire Girls and the Boy Scouts. The Girl Scouts, 4-H, and Campfire Girls all focused on teaching domestic skills. Girls were trained how to care for those in the home and their community by learning skills such as cooking, sewing, and first aid. These skills would be used in new and creative ways by the girls in all three groups during World War I. The women and children were then working in support of the nation while the young men went off to fight by taking added responsibilities in and outside of the home. 
The Boy Scouts were also the ones who provided the police protection in the Wichita Air Show. And they were also downtown trying to convince people to buy war bonds. And they were the ones who threw the newspapers off the tall buildings as the Curtis Jennies flew through the downtown area. There were also tents set up at these air shows where various organizations could provide services, distribute literature, and seek new members. The National Women's Liberty Loan Committee had chapters in all the large cities, and they also organized teams in those cities to cover every neighborhood to solicit war bonds in states where it was allowed. The Red Cross was a huge organization at that time and politically important. These organizations were able to march together in the parades that followed a week later. Their show was mostly just entertainment. It was successful, but not well organized by their planning committee. However, Wichita fortunately had a good transportation system for moving people to the flying field and then back to the downtown area once it was over. And I'm sure readers of Kansas history and the listeners to this podcast are dying to know, are there any other projects that you're currently working on that they can look forward to? Yeah, right now I have an article that's pending. I'm doing a final edits this next week on an article in the Minnesota History Magazine. And the name of this article is Victor Lone Flying Circus in the Twin Ports, April 20th, 1919, and Superior's Mysterious Victor Lone Quota Discrepancy. Now, the discrepancy had to do with the fact that all Superior's war bond drives were heavily oversubscribed, but their quotas were never established commensurate with Duluth's during each of the five Liberty and Victory loan bo- loans based upon their population size. Now, overall, Superior only subscribed a little over 23% as much money as Duluth did in all five Liberty loan drives. Now, both cities also had immense, excuse me, immense amount of civic pride, and they hosted parades to boost enthusiasm from amongst their prospective bond purchasers. Now, the disparity that really stood apart was on April 21st, 1919, when Superior reported $492,050 subscribed, which was 41% of their quota of bonds to sell. And they said it was a huge success. Now, Duluth, on the other hand, they reported $850,000 of bonds that they sold the same day, but they considered to be somewhat of a failure. A part of superior success, however, can be attributed to good planning by staging their Victory Loan Parade and hosting the Flying Circus Air Show just prior to the opening of the Victory Loan Drive. Now, at the same time, Superior's quota should have been set much higher since their population was about 42% of Duluth's population. Yet Superior's quota of Victory Loan bonds to sell was only 18% as much as Duluth's quota. Now, this left Duluth struggling to sell bonds by the May 10th closing date and Superior overselling bonds without trying. I've also spent the last year research and writing, and I'm just now finishing formatting a book manuscript on the lives of America's top scoring World War I observation pilot and observers. Uh, the pilot is William P. Irwin, who flew in the Wichita Air Show, and the two observers that he mostly flew with in the first aero squadron during World War I, Fern Bauckham and Arthur Easterbrook. Thank you so much for joining me, Mr. Rosler. It's been fascinating, and I know that our listeners have been looking forward to this topic. I really appreciate the opportunity. Just a great opportunity, and I really enjoy talking to you, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about the topics discussed on this podcast, consider becoming a subscriber to our journal, Kansas History, a journal of the Central Plains. Visit our webpage on the Kansas State University's Department of History website to learn how, or follow us on Facebook at KS History Journal.